Hello, I'm Jack Perkins. Welcome to Biography. Chicago in the Roaring Twenties, a town of unending parties, unlimited booze, and unrelenting violence. Behind much of that action was one man. They called him Scarface. Al Capone, the most powerful man in the underworld. Back in the twenties, Al Capone lorded over a criminal empire worth hundreds of millions of dollars. For a time, he virtually ruled all of Chicago. Capone's power came from his mix of generosity and brutality. He was willing to pay off anyone who could help him and murder anyone who wouldn't. Today on Biography, we hear from some of the people who knew him well and survived the notorious Al Capone. Al Capone rose to power with a deadly combination of raw brutality and brains. He wanted the public to love him, but those who dared to cross him knew better. Scarface Al Capone was a very, very evil man. For the big fellow, killing was just part of his business plan. A plan to become the CEO of organized crime in Chicago. Al Capone was not stupid. Hell, if he was a person who took a legal job, he'd be head of General Motors. But as king of the bootleggers during Prohibition, Scarface Al became more of a celebrity than any mere corporate executive. He became the most famous gangster in the world. Alphonse Capone was a first-generation American, born January 17, 1899. His parents had many dreams when they left Naples for America. But when they settled in Brooklyn, the Capones found hardship. They lived first in a tenement in the crime-filled Navy Yard District. Life was rough for the Capones as they struggled to escape the waterfront. They finally moved, when Al was 10, to a better neighborhood. He had a perfectly fine mother and father. His mother was devoutly religious to the end of her life. His father was a perfectly respectable barber. No reason to believe that any of the children would grow up to be anything other than perfectly respectable children, and they all grew up to be criminals. Al's criminal path started early. He joined the toughest local gangs, stole things, and when necessary, used his fists. Young Al had flair. He was a cut above the punks who roamed the neighborhood with him. When he saw an elderly widow's washboard being stolen uh, when he was a kid, um, he organized a kid gang to go get it, to retrieve it, to beat up the kids, the other kids who stole it, and to return it to her, and then to lead a parade, a, a sort of a celebratory parade afterwards, in which he could portray himself and play the hero. Um, so even at a very young age, even pre-adolescent, you can sort of begin to see the outlines of the Al Capone who grew up with a kind of a Robin Hood legend. Capone learned more on the street than he ever did in school. He dropped out in sixth grade after smacking his teacher and in turn getting a thrashing from the principal. What he learned was how to shoot, first with a pool cue, then with a gun. Capone caused trouble with his buddies, but he also helped support his big family. Al tried the straight life, working in a munitions factory, as a pin setter in a bowling alley, and as a cloth cutter in a book bindery. He also, as a sideline, became a bouncer out in Coney Island in a uh, bar known as the Harvard Inn, which is kind of a joke because it was owned by a gangster named Frankie Yale. That's where Capone really got his first taste of mob life or gangster life in New York. It was also where a small-time hoodlum, Frank Galluccio, shielded his little sister, Lena, from Capone's advances and marked 18-year-old Al full life. Capone came over to the table, bent over and said to Lena loud enough so that the people at the next table swiveled their heads in surprise at the language, which was strange. Honey, you got a beautiful ass, and I mean that as a compliment, really. 
Defending his sister's honor, Galluccio pulled out a knife and slashed the left side of Capone's face, giving rise to the nickname he hated, Scarface. Capone was ashamed of the scars, sometimes using powder to hide them, preferring to be photographed from the right side and saying the scars were the result of a war injury. These formative years were when Capone caught the eye of a sharp Brooklyn mobster, 17 years his senior. Johnny Torrio would become Capone's role model. Torrio moved to Chicago to run things for Vice Lord Big Jim Colosimo. Big Jim controlled a string of gambling dens and whorehouses. Colosimo's nightclub, just south of downtown, was where the action was. Entertainers, gangsters, and politicians crowded the joint. Big Jim's empire swelled. Torrio needed a lieutenant with brains as well as brawn, so he recruited Capone. With the imminent passage of Prohibition, Al would be an asset to Torrio. People he knew weren't going to stop drinking, um, and this opened up a brand new tax-free business to him. Al Capone, only 19, had just become a father and husband in that order. He married an Irish girl, May Coughlin, who was two years older. Al, May, and their baby came to Chicago in 1919. The city would never be the same. In the Roaring Twenties, Chicago was synonymous with corruption. Wild nightlife, rampant crime, and flowing booze. When Prohibition became the law in January 1920, it was a special invitation for 20-year-old Al Capone to scheme, move in, take over, and kill anyone who got in his way. Within a few years, Capone would be running a criminal organization the likes of which Chicago had never seen. But first, he had some things to learn from his boss, Johnny Torrio. Torrio was Capone's mentor. It was coming up through the ranks, being attractive to the boss, having the boss say, this is someone who might succeed me one day. I'm going to bring him along. You started out in one of the houses of prostitution, either as a bartender slash uh, bouncer slash pimp uh, slash roper. There's stories of supposedly Capone standing outside in front of one of the houses just saying to passersby, hey buddy, we've got some nice girls inside. The hot spot where Capone worked was Colosimo's nightclub, watering hole for the city's high rollers. With prohibition, Torrio saw dollar signs. Bootlegging was his answered prayer, but his boss, Big Jim Colosimo, thought he was rich enough and didn't need a new racket. Without Big Jim, Torrio couldn't expand. Exit Big Jim, but someone had to do it, and it was Capone who was the one who was chosen to arrange it. Al hired his former New York boss, Frankie Yale, to do the killing. Big Jim was rubbed out in May of 1920 in the lobby of his own club. The style of this hit was to become a hallmark of Capone's murders. Planned, deliberate, and witnesses who had sudden amnesia. Now, Torrio and Capone could take over and cash in on bootlegging. Capone had the right instincts, but he still needed some polish. Torrio took the rough edges off of Capone. Aside from everything else, he insisted that he go to night school to improve his accent. He must have had a Brooklyn accent, but evidently, he ended up without that kind of an accent. The people who knew him later in life said, no, he had no particular accent at all. Capone rose quickly through the ranks of the underworld. He never wanted to be thought of as a criminal, but rather as a gentleman with a passion for opera and the finer things money could buy. Well, he was a very snappy dresser for those days, but not exactly in the Brooks Brothers mode. Um, he went to yellow and green were his dominant fashion statement colors with a, a milky white borsalino fedora that was a jam. He wore a, a huge 11 and a half carat pinky ring that cost $50,000. He wore Italian glove silk underwear. His style earned him the nickname he liked, snorky, meaning sharp dresser. Al was flamboyant. His five foot ten and a half inches, 175 pounds, commanding attention as he and his gang swept into nightclubs. He used to come in with four or five guys, and they'd all sit at the table, and then the girls would come over, the hostesses in the club. They'd all come around, make a big fuss over him, and he'd give them money. You know, he was very liberal. Oh, sure, I met him. 
He was a very nice person, as, as to know him, you know. And I, what they said so many, tra he never did anything. It was his people that did it, like his men that he had or whatever, do the dirty work. Many people only believed in Capone's good nature. They didn't see evil, just generosity. Like the time he spilled a drink on a showgirl's new dress. But it was all wet, and I thought, my God, what am I going to do, you know, like for the rest of the night? So he did give me some money to go and have it taken care of. I didn't want to take it, and he says, no, you take this. He gave me, I think, $25, I think it was. Well, if he was sitting at the table, he'd call me over, and then every once in a while, when he was, would come into the club or something, he, he'd say, get the kid up on the stage and let him do the Charleston, you know, and uh, get a $5 bill. And uh, that was terrific, you know. Capone's family thought he was terrific, too. When his father died in 1920, Al, the dutiful son, brought his family to Chicago. Together, the Capones lived in a 15-room house on the south side. He brought his brothers into the rackets and supported his sisters comfortably. To the day she died, his younger sister, Mafalda, defended him, writing, I know nothing about his activities outside the family and do not recall any conversations about business matters. Outside the family, he was a different guy. He was regularly unfaithful. He was a lusty man who was dealing with prostitutes and sampled the wares. He would get drunk. He would be away from home for long periods, long periods of time. He, in effect, would live away from home. When he wasn't out drinking, gambling, or whoring, Capone studied his boss, Torrio. He learned how Chicago was divvied up and how to bring gangland together to fill the city's thirst for alcohol. In 1922, under Torrio's design, local mobsters made a peace agreement. Everyone would get a cut of the action. That was Torrio's uh, modus operandi to uh, try and get everybody together and agree. And, and Capone learned that from Torrio. I think Capone learned to suppress his uh, perhaps naturally violent instincts. This strategy turned bootlegging into big business. Supply was controlled, from breweries to backyard stills. Saloon owners, if they were smart, bought Capone's beer. If you didn't, they would come back and tell you, you better take their beer. This happened over and over again. If you didn't do that again, they would bomb your place, and they would blow out the windows. And then they would offer to lend you the money to repair it. Well, nobody else would give you the money to repair your place. Of course, once you did that, you were, in effect, in business with the Capone organization. The government's estimate is that they took in, on average, $120 million a year in sales from liquor, prostitution, gambling, basically. So they were the equivalent of a uh, probably medium-sized corporation. And it was run in many ways like a business. There were guys with specific functions, like in charge of beer truck repair, in charge of brewery construction, in charge of brewery management. Capone was a brilliant businessman and a brilliant organizer. He couldn't invest money in, in the conventional sense because that would supply the government with a trail to his organization. So it was an all-cash business that he was in, which was the trinity of gambling, prostitution, and vice. Capone also guaranteed protection from the law by bribing cops and politicians. Al Capone himself once estimated that 50 percent of the Chicago police force worked for him. So that's a big part of doing business, otherwise you wouldn't operate for a minute if you weren't getting protection. 1922 was the year that Capone finally got officially noticed by the Chicago press. In the early hours of August 30th, he was arrested after a night of boozing. Capone's temper erupted when the car he was driving slammed into a taxi, badly injuring the driver. He pulled a gun and threatened the taxi driver, waving around a fake sheriff's badge. When the real police showed up, Capone was arrested. He taunted the officer, boasting that he'd fix this thing. Easy. He did. The charges were dropped. Word that Al walked got around fast. His legend was growing. Now just 23 years old, Al became Torrio's partner at the top of the crime world. While attempts to quench the public's thirst stepped up, so did greed. In 1923, the gangland peace negotiated under Torrio shattered. Chicago's notorious beer wars began and grabbed headlines nationwide. Blood flowed and bombs exploded from September through December. For Capone's enemies, it ended in death. The only thing these guys would do would be to respond with violence. And violence is sort of a, uh, 
a currency for them. It's, uh, it's what they use to uh, get their way. During the entire Prohibition era, 700 people were murdered uh, in Chicago in uh, bootlegging or Prohibition-related crimes. Torrio and Capone won the first round of the gang wars. Confident that control was restored, Torrio went on a four-month cruise leaving Capone in charge, giving him license to become the most powerful man in the city. 1924 ushered in a new era for Al Capone. In Chicago, corruption took a detour when a law and order man was elected mayor. Despite his personal distaste for prohibition, he enforced it. So Al set his sights on opportunities for growth in the suburbs, starting with Cicero. It only made him uh, seem to be a much stronger uh, criminal leader. Um, by expanding into the suburbs, he was really able to seal up Chicago lock, stock, and barrel for his own. Cicero was made to order for Capone's gang. It was a working-class bedroom community of 60,000 where bribery worked like a charm. From suburban headquarters at the Hawthorne Hotel, Al cut deals with local officials to operate beer and gambling joints. To keep his power base, Capone rigged the Cicero election. His men shot, beat up, and held voters hostage who were opposed to mob rule. On election day, April 1st, 1924, the Capone ticket was victorious. But Al suffered one major defeat. His 30-year-old brother Frank was killed in a shootout with Chicago police. The death of Frank Capone, um, I think, had a profound effect on Al and turned him from a kind of low-key Johnny Torrio type of racketeer into a much more desperate and violent hoodlum. Um, it made him feel that his own life could be cut short at any time and that uh, he, should, he would go for as much as he could. The week after Frank's death, Capone opened Cicero's first betting parlor, the Hawthorne Smoke Shop. Capone always said he had bad luck with horses, but now it didn't matter because he got a hefty take of racetrack profits, especially when the races were fixed. To his friends, he doled out hot tips like candy. He and his bodyguards were walking around and he comes by the racetrack and he says, hey kid, how you doing? He says, you see number six? He said, he's gonna win. So one of his goons came over and slipped a ticket in my pocket. It was a $5 ticket. The horse went off at 60 to 1. And with my $5, I think I, I collected something like 300 and some dollars. Capone and his boss, Johnny Torrio, now had their hands in the till of 160 gambling joints and 123 saloons just in Cicero. Not everyone, however, was so impressed. A crusading 21-year-old newspaper editor, Robert St. John, was disgusted. In his paper, he exposed town leaders on the mob payroll and detailed a Capone brothel with a death chamber run by Al's older brother, Ralph. And of course, uh, that made me an enemy of the Capones. As I was going to my office early one morning, I glanced up and saw a big black touring car come roaring toward the intersection. This car screeched to a halt and four men jumped out. I recognized Ralph Capone immediately. and They headed for me and I was halfway across the intersection. I dropped uh, to the ground, curled up, and put my head between my legs and uh, they gave me a real working over. Black jacks and billies and but the interesting weapon they used was a cake of soap in a knitted woolen sock. This was one of their, the Capone's favorite uh, murder instruments because if they, if using this instrument, if they hit uh, the base in the neck, in the base of the skull, uh, uh, you can kill a person. This time though, it didn't work. St. John survived and was hospitalized. And when I got out to pay my bill, uh, the cashier of the hospital said, oh, your bill was paid this morning. And I said, it was some mistake. He can't have been paid. Uh, oh, yes, and they described the man who had paid it. Uh, a, uh, a slight scar on his left cheek. It was Capone. To add insult to injury, Big Al had also bought controlling interest in St. John's newspaper. Capone's takeover of other suburbs was easier. In Chicago Heights, he helped local mobsters win their gang war. In return, Capone made a financial killing, gaining an interstate bootlegging network. 
At one time, it was reported that Chicago Heights was worth around $36 million to him. By having the Chicago Heights people behind him, uh, his network would virtually double in size. Capone joined forces with the Chicago Heights mob. And in a town where corruption ruled, the big fellow was royalty. And there were times when he'd ride in an open car and people would come up to him and shake his hand. And, um, you know, he would, he would treat people um, like they were his friends, uh, like, like they were family. And uh, because of that, they had a lot of respect for him. That respect paid off. While Capone's boss, Johnny Torrio, was away on his cruise, Al expanded operations, formed new allies, and reaped the profits. When Torrio came back, if there had ever been any question in Torrio's mind that Al Capone was the man to succeed him, that ended it. There was also no question about Capone's explosive temper or loyalty. On May 8th, when Al's accountant, Greasy Thumb Jack Guzik, whined that he'd been kicked around by a local bootlegger, Al took aim. He unloaded a six-shooter into the culprit's head, point blank, in front of three witnesses. No one forgot it, but no one would say they remembered it. Al went into hiding, but later turned himself into the police, saying he was out of town the day of the murder. Once again, he beat the rap. There was no way to get Capone on any of the substantive charges. You couldn't get a jury. They knew what would happen to them if they voted a conviction against a gangster. And they said as much. People would ask to be excused. I'd have to carry a gun the rest of my life, said one of them asking to be excused. Capone knew it. He went about his business, ordering the elimination of people who refused to cooperate. The one-way ride was the preferred method. Let's get him in a car and let's take him to a nice secluded place and shoot him and dump him out of the car so there are no one witnesses, two innocent bystanders, or any particular problems beyond it. Capone's biggest problem that had to be taken care of was Northside gangster and well-known florist Dean O'Banion. O'Banion had plenty of power and money, but wanted more. He made a fatal mistake when he tried to swindle Capone and his boss, Torrio, on a brewery deal. On the morning of May 19th, Torrio got arrested in a prohibition raid O'Banion knew about. Torrio was on his way to the slammer, but not before he'd get revenge. Once again, New York triggerman Frankie Yale got the nod. Yale would do the job with two local hitmen. They decided to kill O'Banion on November 10th when he was busy preparing flowers for a gangster funeral. When the three hitmen walked into the flower shop, O'Banion reached out to shake Yale's hand. Yale held on as the others pumped O'Banion full of lead. It was the end of O'Banion and the beginning of a bloody gang war. That's because in January 1925, two of O'Banion's men, George Bugs Moran and Jaime Weiss, tried to avenge their boss's murder and went gunning for Capone and Torrio. They missed Al, but managed to ambush Torrio. Torrio recovered and was sent to prison on the prohibition charge. In March, while serving time, he announced his retirement. To no one's surprise, leadership of the mob was passed to Capone, then just 26 years old. The youthful mob boss was front page news. He liked being in the limelight. When accused of a crime, he'd call a press conference. And he'd say, hey, look, fella, I had nothing to do with this. Please, get off of my back. But the truth was Capone had everything to do with Chicago's increasingly vicious gang violence. Al was now a moving target. He shielded himself in his new high security headquarters in the plush Metropole Hotel. Secret tunnels helped Al and his men make quick getaways. He never went anywhere alone. Capone had more security than President Calvin Coolidge. He rode in a $20,000 customized Cadillac limousine that was more like a tank. It was seven tons, armor-plated, with bulletproof glass. The back window could be yanked when gunmen had to fire at their enemies. Capone now had his share. They kept encroaching on each other's territory. Wasn't supposed to happen, it did, they shot each other. Capone was going to have to eliminate one by one the opposition again, bring one by one, bring them all in line. All Capone had to do now was give the orders. He did, and he never looked back. Nineteen twenty-five echoed with gunshots. 
Violence was escalating with no end in sight. Al Capone and his enemies were fighting with a new weapon, the Tommy gun. It immediately changed the rules of the game because they were much more violent than pistols. Once you combined a machine gun with a moving car, you had a lethal instrument, uh, the likes of which had never been seen before. Um, so they upped the ante in all the gangster wars. Chicago was, for better or worse, kind of the, uh, the example par excellence of, of gangland and gangland violence. The violence was much more noticeable and spectacular here than, say, in New York or elsewhere. Capone, however, brought violence to New York. He went there in late December to take his son to a doctor. Then he gave his buddy Frankie Yale a Christmas present, slaughtering three of Yale's enemies. Capone and his men were arrested. As usual, all the witnesses were silent, and the charges were dropped. Al came back to Chicago, to 1926 and the continuing gang war. The stakes were getting higher when on April 27th, Al led a five-car assault on a rival gang. Outside a Cicero bar, Capone and his men opened fire. The tally, three wounded, three dead, including a 25-year-old assistant state's attorney. Bill McSwiggan had stayed close with his childhood buddies who were Capone's enemies. There was an outcry over the murder of a public official, so Capone vanished. In fact, he went to Lansing, Michigan, where he hid out at a little cottage uh, with his mistress uh, for the summer until the heat was off. Um, after a while, he uh, began negotiations with the Illinois state authorities and delivered himself uh, into their custody. Despite a major investigation, a coroner's inquest, and the convening of six grand juries, Capone was never indicted. Once again, he got off, proclaiming his innocence. Capone appeared untouchable. In fact, one day, he went to a courthouse, a jail, and a police station, asking if there was any policeman there, any cop, any detective, any judge who wanted to arrest him. Nobody did. Nobody dared. And, of course, he brought a reporter around with him, uh, to show that he was not a wanted man in Chicago. I was the only photographer and, and, the, uh, and the paper had the only reporter with him. And we went to all these places. And all these places wanted nothing to do with him. Not everyone stayed out of Capone's way. Trigger-happy Jaime Weiss and Bugs Moran traded shots with Al all during the summer of 1926, but none hit their mark. The most spectacular attempt of all came in late September. Capone was having lunch at the Hawthorne restaurant when a 10-car caravan filled with Weiss's men roared around the corner. Machine gun fire split the air. Capone leapt up and started to run. His bodyguard, it registered on him before it registered on Capone that something is wrong and there's going to be more. They must have been blanks to make us find out what's happening. He dove forward, knocked Capone to the floor and was holding him down when the rest of the cars came by with real machine guns and they just shot up the entire block. Finally a gunman got out, knelt in the doorway and sprayed the whole place. 5,000 bullets blasted the coffee shop in just under 10 minutes. It was destroyed but amazingly no one was killed. Capone paid hospital bills for the one person injured. Then he turned his attention to getting rid of Weiss. Capone ordered his men to rent rooms that overlooked the Weiss Moran headquarters. When they spotted Weiss crossing the street, they opened fire. One more problem eliminated. Soon after, Bugs Moran became leader of the Northside Gang. Capone sent him condolences about Weiss, denying any involvement with his assassination. In late October, Capone made a peace agreement with Moran and other gang leaders. Al later said, there's plenty of beer business for everybody. Why kill each other over it? At age 27, Capone's power in the underworld was growing. But he craved recognition as an upstanding businessman. After all, he employed more than 400 people and controlled a multi-million dollar operation. He didn't go running around with a, uh, a machine gun shooting people out of fast-moving cars you would find him in his office, surrounded by junior executives with the phones jangling, three people waiting to, to get a little bit of his time for an executive decision. That was his, his working day. That's the kind of criminal he was. In other words, he was a modern criminal.
1927 started as a good year for Al by all measures. The U.S. Attorney's Office would estimate his organization took in $105 million that year, all from unlawful enterprises. One of his allies, Big Bill Thompson, was voted back in as mayor of Chicago, giving control of the city, in effect, to Capone. When things were going his way, Al tried to relax. He took his son to baseball games. He boxed. He liked to have a good time. Capone said he was tired of being underappreciated in his role as public servant, that he needed a getaway. So he bought one. In January 1928, Capone paid $40,000 in cash for a 14-room mansion on Palm Island, Florida, near Miami. He invested another $100,000 in improvements to make it a paradise. Still, this wouldn't shelter Capone from problems starting to brew in his own organization. Al learned that his favorite New York hitman, Frankie Yale, was stealing East Coast booze shipments. Loyalty was paramount to Capone, and he felt betrayed. Yale had killed often for Capone. Now the tables were turned. On July 1st, 1928, Yale was the victim, chased and shot down in New York by Al's gunman. Capone still had one significant rival, Bugs Moran. Moran's gang was hijacking the mob's whiskey. Capone was fed up with Moran's antics, and at the end of December, he went to Florida to mastermind what would become his most infamous crime. The St. Valentine's Day Massacre was one of the most fascinating and complicated uh, hits in the history of uh, gangland in this country, probably also the most celebrated. On the morning of February 14, 1929, Moran was late getting to his warehouse. His men were there waiting for a shipment of whiskey. Strangers walked in, two dressed as cops, two others in plain clothes. Moran's men, thinking it was a raid, put their hands up, turned and faced the wall, and instantly were mowed down. An inquest was assembled to investigate. Moran and others pointed the finger at Capone, but Al had an airtight alibi. He was in Florida in a meeting with the district attorney in Miami at the time of the shootings. Once again, with no one willing to testify, the case was closed. No one knows for sure who did it. My theory is they thought the last person to go in, who looked quite a bit like Moran and was wearing the same outfit that Moran wore, a light overcoat with a darker brown um, fedora. I think they thought he was Moran. The city and the country were sickened by this killing, but the bloodshed wasn't over. The St. Valentine's Day Massacre was the most graphic show of violence yet. Now, there was no escape for Capone. He was to become the target of criminals and lawmen alike. Public disgust with the St. Valentine's Day Massacre had barely subsided when Al Capone made his next move to clean house. In May 1929, Al's informants told him hitmen John Scalise and Albert Anselmi and another gunman were conspiring to murder him. Capone invited them to a roadhouse in Indiana. He got their confidence and threw a banquet for them. And they had a wonderful evening drinking and eating. And then at the end of the night, then the uh, tables turned and he accused them of treachery. And he and his bodyguards uh, beat him to death with baseball bats before shooting him, of course. And I photographed the three bodies that were found in the brushes in Hammond. Their heads were smashed. They were bad. The police picked up the bodies and they took them to a commercial area. And we had uh, taken pictures of them covered up. You only show a little bit of their face. It was a really hideous crime. In fact, it was so hideous that even other gangsters began to distance themselves from Capone at that time. Suddenly, trouble was everywhere for Capone. Public sentiment against him was growing. His life was in danger. There was a $50,000 contract out on him. Al figured the only place he'd be safe was in a jail, away from Chicago. So he set it up. On May 16th, leaving a movie theater in Philadelphia, Capone and his bodyguard were arrested for carrying concealed weapons. The scheme went haywire when the judge threw the book at them. The verdict was stiff. A year in jail. Al tried everything to get out early, from bribery to giving money to local charities at Christmas. It didn't work. So Al used his phone privileges to run his gang, long distance from jail. The news he got from home was bad. Capone and his organization were now a target of the federal government. President Hoover wanted to see Big Al behind bars for a long time. 
He kept asking his aides, have you got that fellow Capone yet? The IRS was working on it, closing in on his gang. While he was still in jail in Philadelphia, Ralph Capone was gotten and was sent away. Jack Guzik was sent away. Frank Nitti, who was Capone's number two, was sent away. All on income tax. When Capone left prison in March 1930, new problems awaited him. He had just been named public enemy number one by the Chicago Crime Commission. But he wanted people to think of him as a good guy. The country was entering the Depression, so Capone responded, opening Chicago's first soup kitchen, feeding 3,000 hungry people a day. I wasn't for our friend Al Capone, old, rotten up in this here White House on 935 South State Street. We wouldn't eat. Capone's generosity made him somewhat of a folk hero in the media. But in June, Al lost one of his major pipelines to the press. Jake Lingle, who covered crime and politics for the Chicago Tribune and was on Capone's payroll, was gunned down by one of Al's rivals. When I looked at him, I said, oh my God, that's Jake. Well, I, I took a picture too and then called the office. I said, Jake Lingle got, was just killed. He was on his way to the racetrack, and the only no reason I know that is because he had a racing farm near him. Capone avenged Lingle's death and began to deal with his newest enemy, the federal government. Pop culture has left the impression that a group of prohibition agents shut down Capone. The untouchables, led by Elliot Ness in reality, did little more than stage a couple of raids for the press. The IRS tax men who had already put away Capone's top lieutenants were the government's real heroes. But it wasn't easy. Legally, Al didn't own a thing. He couldn't buy real estate. Um, he put his house in Florida. In his wife's name, he put his house in Chicago. In his mother's name, he put his car in his wife's name. He didn't keep ledgers, but some of his bookkeepers kept ledgers. And eventually the IRS discovered the ledgers, was able to decipher the ledgers, and was able to um, track some of the codes in the ledgers to Capone's old bookkeepers, and then track them back uh, to Capone himself. It took five years to bring all the evidence together. On June 5, 1931, the man known as Alphonse Capone was indicted on 22 counts of income tax evasion dating from 1925 through 1929. The prosecution, led by United States Attorney George E.Q. Johnson, said Capone owed Uncle Sam just over $215,000. Capone did everything in his power to control the outcome of this case. Capone hired five hoodlums uh, to come out here from New York to kill my father. And uh, they were spotted here, and the Secret Service had tailed them enough to stop this, and Capone was convinced you better send them home. This was just before the trial. We had a squad car, a Chicago squad car, in front of our house on the south side of Chicago, and one in the back part of the house. My father had Secret Service with him all the time, doing this thing. It was the only way to keep him alive. Capone tried to plea bargain, but the judge wouldn't hear of it. Then Capone opened his wallet to buy off the jury. But when the judge found out, he switched jurors moments before the trial was set to begin on October 7th. There was no real defense for Capone. With so many hardworking Americans paying taxes on small salaries and so many out of work, there wasn't much sympathy for Big Al, the big spender. The jury was out nine hours. There were 22 ballots taken. And, as we know by history, that uh, Al Capone was found guilty of income tax evasion. Not murder, not pimping, not all the dirty things he did or killing, but income tax. But that was the only way he could be prosecuted, and that's what my father did. Capone was sentenced to 11 years behind bars, the stiffest penalty of any tax case to date. It's safe to assume that Capone never expected to be convicted, or if he was convicted, he expected to spend perhaps a year or two in jail, not 10 or 11 years. As he left court, he looked to the photographers and said, get enough, boys. You won't be seeing me for a long time. Capone appealed the verdict, but lost, and went from Chicago's Cook County Jail to federal prison in Atlanta. In August 1934, he was sent to the Rock, Alcatraz. At Alcatraz, Capone kept to himself. His old ways didn't work there. In 1936, a fellow prisoner tried to kill him, stabbing Capone in the back with a pair of scissors. 
In 1938, Al was officially diagnosed as suffering the degenerative effects of syphilis, picked up from one of his prostitute girlfriends. His mind was going. Capone needed medical treatment, and in January 1939, he was transferred to the Federal Correctional Center outside Los Angeles. In November, he was released from prison and sent to Union Memorial Hospital in Baltimore. Al returned to Florida in March 1940. Syphilis ate away at Capone for the rest of his life. At age 48, on January 25th, 1947, Alphonse Capone died of cardiac arrest. His body was taken to Chicago for burial. Well, it was a very cold day in January of 1947. In fact, it was 11 below zero at the time. It was a huge funeral because uh, hundreds of persons turned out. There was an edict by Anthony J. Accardo, who was the boss of the mob and had been a former bodyguard for Al Capone, to all crime syndicate gangsters to show up at the funeral and pay their respects to Al Capone, even though Al Capone had no power and was helpless when he died. Capone's run as a mob kingpin was over, but his fingerprints on crime and Chicago's reputation lives on. There's no doubt but that the, the Capone era established the underpinnings of what is now the Chicago organized crime family. Uh, it gave it, the mob, a start here in the Windy City. Um, and that, uh, that beginning uh, led to uh, a zenith in activity in the 50s and 60s uh, and into the 70s. It was and continues to be in some form an alliance between the hoodlums that began under Capone and, and elected public officials. Chicago can't shake its link with the big fellow. In 1993, a tourist attraction paying homage to him opened. His legend lives on. I'm Big Al, A.C. Alphonse Capone. My father uh, made many speeches and made this point about Al Capone on numerous occasions that had this man taken all his energy, talent, and basic intelligence and guts, if you will, and directed uh, this energy down legitimate uh, avenues, he'd been a very successful businessman. There's no doubt about it. Uh, he had a peculiar charm about him that he could use when he wanted to use. And this, of course, was deceptive. But as we all know, he didn't use his talent in that direction. And uh, as a result, people died, people were hurt, and Chicago lost its reputation. Well, of course, Capone is world famous. Wherever you go, if you mention Chicago, people instantly associate that city with Capone. There are lo lots of celebrities. Very, very few of them become allusions. So their name means the same thing to everyone who hears it. Capone was one. He never impressed me of, of anything except that he was a bad guy. And the reason that maybe that I felt that way is because I happen to be an Italian. And anybody that um, that hurts an Italian person, I feel, I feel hurt. And so, well, let's end this. To me, he was a bum. In 1933, a Chicago entrepreneur decided to cash in on Al Capone's legend. He opened a museum called Capone's Chicago. Tourists could buy t-shirts with Capone's likeness or watch a reenactment of the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. It's only recently that Capone's Chicago went out of business, and that closing delighted many Chicagoans who felt the museum glorified a brutal man who symbolized the city's most violent era. Well, whether those Chicagoans like it or not, the truth is that Al Capone remains one of Chicago's most famous names. For Biography, I'm Jack Perkins. Thanks for watching.